everyone. Welcome back to my channel. Uh, my name is Courtney if you're new here and every week I share one of these what's for dinner videos just to kind of give you guys a glimpse into my kitchen what I'm cooking for my family of five. Some weeks I do some really creative things, some weeks I'm trying new recipes off of Pinterest and some weeks I'm just doing some old family favorites. Kind of depends on what we've got going on. This week I have six meals to share with you guys which is more than usual. Typically, I do have more leftover meals, but that's just not how it worked out this week. All right, so let's jump right in. First meal of the week, this was um, lunch on Sunday, I think it was, and I was cooking some pecan smoked chicken wings that I had purchased from Walmart. They're smoked, they're breaded, you just throw them in the oven, oven and cook them for like 45 minutes. Um, I didn't share that with you guys because it's just frozen pre-cooked chicken. It was good, don't get me wrong, definitely good, but thing that I did make is definitely a family favorite. These are corn fritters. Um, I've had these a lot of different ways. In fact, I've actually made them different ways before. Occasionally, I will make a different batter that kind of rises and gets a little more puffy, but this is my easy, go-to, quick, simple recipe for corn fritters. I start with one can of creamed corn, and I added in one egg. I added in probably about a teaspoon to a teaspoon and a half of seasoning. I'm using the Kinder's. Uh, it's just salt, pepper, and garlic powder, but in the past I've used Montreal steak seasoning and that is really, really good. Then I added in about a cup and a half of flour, mixed it really well so there's no lumps or clumps, and then I'm just putting it in a skillet that has some oil in the bottom. I'm not like completely deep frying these, but you do basically fry them. And I'm just going to let them cook there until they're done. I'll flip them over. These stay pretty flat, but they do get really nice and golden brown. They have a ton of flavor. They're super, super delicious and really, really easy. And this recipe, I mean, it makes a lot of these corn fritters and it's very, very economical. Of course, in the background, I do have um, some green beans cooking. Those are just a couple of cans of green beans, some Worcestershire sauce, soy sauce, brown sugar, bacon. I've made them before on my channel quite a number of times, but there was our dinner. The chicken was really good. Green beans are always delicious, and those corn fritters are so, so good. Let me know if you guys give them a try. Okay, so on to the next night. I'm actually making some beef tenders that I had in the freezer. That's all it says on the package. They're pre-seasoned. I picked them up at Market Street. They were on sale. It's just two pieces of beef that I'm going to cook. You'll see them here in just a minute. But I am working on a side, which is a corn squash. Um, man, I don't even remember the first time I tried this. It was probably about 10 years ago. It was kind of intimidating to me because I wasn't even sure where to start with one of these guys. But now I am so familiar with these. My family loves uh, acorn squash. We love butternut squash. It's all so, so good. So I am starting off by just slicing these in half. And I'm going to go ahead and use a spoon to just scoop out all the seeds and all the stuff in the middle. Then I'm going to bake them at 400 degrees for like 30 to 40 minutes. As you can see, they got a little golden brown going on there. So, so delicious. I do them face down. And then, of course, when they're done, I pull them out and flip them over just so I can test for doneness. These are nice and soft. As you can see, I just put on my handy-dandy oven mitt there so I could grip them. And I'm just scooping out the inside and putting it in a bowl. And I kind of make these like a mashed sweet potato, I guess. Um, you can do these in a million different ways, but typically I like to do butter, cinnamon. Um, sometimes I'll put in like allspice or nutmeg, just depending on what I've got going on. And then I kind of vary between brown sugar and honey. Today I'm going to use honey uh, because that's what I grabbed first out of the pantry. Really, it was right there in front of my face. So <laughs> that's what we're using today. Either one works great. I do wish I would have remembered that I had maple syrup, though. I think that would be fantastic. So I started off with about a tablespoon of butter and I'm letting that melt in. As you can see, the squash is super duper hot. And now I'm going to sprinkle in some cinnamon. So that's two acorn squash and I did about a teaspoon of cinnamon and I'm going to do about a quarter teaspoon of nutmeg and then I'm going to do two tablespoons of honey. And if you're doing brown sugar, two to three tablespoons of that works great too. And a pinch of salt. Um, if you don't know, salt really kind of helps bring out the sweetness. I know it sounds weird, but it's just kind of how things work. And I always add a pinch of salt to sweet things that I'm cooking, like cookies or brownies, and something like this if I want to kind of accentuate the sweetness of this acorn squash, which is pretty naturally sweet on its own. That salt really, really helps do it. But anyway, these are nice and delicious, something a little bit different. I know it's kind of sweet and sugary, but oh man, it's so, so delicious. So here are some beef tenders. I picked these up at Market Street. 
they just come to in a package. They've got some steakhouse seasoning on them. That's it. Basically, they're kind of like a steak. So I just threw them on my flat top griddle with a little bit of bacon grease and I'm just searing them all the way around on the outside. I am not trying to cook them all the way through. I'm just looking to develop a little bit of color and caramelization on the outside of the meat just to develop some more flavors. Once that's done, I'm going to pop them in a 400 degree oven and I have one of those um, probe wired meat thermometers that I'll stick in one of them. The wire comes out. I can see what the temperature is at all times. So I'm going to cook them to a nice rareness because we do like to eat our steaks rare. Um, I really cannot suggest getting one of those enough. Those thermometers are pretty cheap. I think I paid about 10, 15 bucks on Amazon and man, they make cooking so, so easy. But look at that. They're all done. A nice, beautiful brownness on the outside. I just sliced them nice and thin, served them with some garlic bread from the freezer and a package of Noor chicken and broccoli rice. So, you know, nothing too fancy, but this was such a good, delicious, flavorful, flavorful meal. All right, on to the next night. So I had this small package of boneless pork ribs in my freezer and I really had no plans for them and I wanted to go ahead and use them up. So I'm going to just cook them, season them and serve them over some fried rice. Super simple, but man, this was such a good dinner. So I'm gonna go ahead and season these with like salt and uh, some pepper. We're gonna do garlic and onion powder and then paprika. My preference of course, as always, is smoked paprika, but if you just have regular, that is fine too. Not a big deal. I'm going to season these really well and then with my gloved hand, go ahead and just kind of mix them around so the seasoning is on all sides of the pork ribs. And then this is something I do when I make any kind of ribs in the oven. Definitely better with beef ribs, but it works to keep the pork nice and juicy and tender too. I'm going to put a little bit of Coca-Cola in there. I've used uh, Coke, I've used Dr. Pepper, I've used Pepsi. Today I'm using Cherry Coke because I have like a tiny bit left in my fridge. It all works the same. It all adds a little bit of flavor and it keeps the meat nice and juicy and delicious while it bakes. So once I've done that, I'm gonna put these in a 200 degree oven for a couple of hours. Um, I wouldn't say more than like two and a half hours really is good. Um, you can definitely overcook the pork, but mine was nicely done. It was tender and delicious at that point. So once you've let it cook for a little while, of course I keep it all wrapped up as you can see, that kind of helps steam it as well. But once you've let it cook for a little while, um, I'm gonna go ahead and pull it out of the oven there and we're gonna take it out of the foil. So what I ended up doing, cause there was so much juice at that point, the meat had a lot of juice, the Coke was in there. I decided I needed some more foil. So I'm just gonna slide that off to the side and put down another brand new sheet of foil. Don't mind my baking sheets. I know they have seen better days. They're pretty old. I've had them for a long time. Uh, anyway, I'm gonna just put those pork ribs on this fresh piece of foil and then we're going to top them with some sauce. Typically when I'm making any kind of Asian rib, I do make my own sauce, but I have a couple of these um, Panda Express sauces floating around in my fridge that I really, really would like to use up and get out of my way. Uh, my fridge lately seems like it's just overpacked with like condiments and sauces and stuff. And I'm over that, I want my space back. So today we're gonna use this orange sauce. Uh, if you've not tried this, I really recommend it. It's got a little bit of spice to it, not bad. Great orangey flavor. Definitely don't confuse it with sweet and sour sauce, completely different than that. But I thought this would be a really nice touch for these, and it was. You know, fruit and pork go together so, so well, so I just really felt like the orange and the pork were gonna be a good pairing. Anyway, I just used my brush and kind of evenly spread it all over those pork ribs, and I'm gonna pop them back in the oven for like, 10-ish minutes or so, not too long, just enough to kind of cook that glaze and get it to caramelize just a little bit. All right, so those are in the oven doing their thing. I'm gonna make some fried rice. So the most important thing about fried rice is you need to have rice that was cooked a long time ago. I cooked mine in the morning and just took the whole uh, pot and put it in the fridge and let it just get cold and left it alone. Um, once the rice is done that, the texture of it changes and it really makes good fried rice. So I put it in my skillet with a little bit of oil um, and then I think I actually added a little baking grease to that as well. And then I tossed in some garlic. Um, I went pretty heavy, probably a good tablespoon if not more on garlic. And then I'm gonna add in some onion powder and a little bit of ginger. Not too heavy, maybe quarter teaspoon on the ginger. I go pretty light on that. And we're just gonna let the rice cook for just a couple of minutes before we start adding in other things. Uh, you can add in whatever you want, really. I've seen people put in like green beans and corn and all kinds of stuff. 
For me, I keep it nice and simple. I'm gonna do salt, pepper, and then a bag of frozen peas and carrots. I like a lot of veggies in mine. Um, I probably put in more than most people would want. So really just kind of be the judge of how much you want and add that in there. Like I said, I, I'm pretty heavy handed. I put in half that bag. So that's just the way I like it. Now I will tell you, don't use canned vegetables. They are so soft and so mushy. They cannot hold up to this frying process. Gotta be frozen vegetables. If you wanna use corn, that's fine out of the can, but anything else I would definitely say go frozen. So once I let that cook until the frozen veggies were completely warmed all the way through, I'm gonna scoot them all the way out to the side and add a little bit more bacon grease into the pan. I just cook bacon a lot on the weekends and just set the grease um, aside in my fridge in a little dish and I use it throughout the week to cook. I don't always have it, but typically I do. Uh, once the bacon grease had melted, I went ahead and scrambled three eggs and just put them in there, put the lid on the pan and let it do its thing. Didn't touch it, didn't mess with it for like four minutes and at that point the egg had pretty much cooked all the way through went ahead and just kind of scrambled it up like that and then we're going to reincorporate it into the rice let everybody get to know each other and have a good time with that party in the pan there and then we're going to get some seasoning and flavor going so i don't do a whole heck of a lot with my fried rice but i do like to add hoisin sauce i'm going to add probably about two tablespoons of that and then I'm going to add in some soy sauce. Soy sauce just brings that beautiful umami flavor. It's so rich and deep. I did probably about a tablespoon of that. Uh, you can do more if you want. My husband doesn't care for soy sauce too much. So I try to go pretty light, but if it was just like myself and my oldest, because we love soy sauce, I'd probably do closer to two tablespoons. Um, anyway, it does bring a lot to the table. It tastes really, really good. And if you have not tried that Polar, 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 I'm not sure how you say it, but that soy sauce, it's different. It's a little bit thicker than regular soy sauce. I love it so much more. The flavor's a little bit better. It's a little bit richer. If you see it at your store, give it a try. Just gonna cook that for a couple of seconds. Just a quick reminder, soy sauce burns, so you don't wanna cook it too long. Anyway, that's it, that's fried rice. I just topped it with the pork ribs. And on the side, I just had a couple of uh, dumplings in my freezer and I just kind of warmed those up and served them on the side. Super good, super delicious. Okay, on to the next night. We're gonna have some fish tacos tonight. And so I'm gonna make some salsa to go with them. I've posted my salsa recipe before, but here's a recap for you guys. I start off with a can of diced tomatoes. My personal recommendation would be fire roasted diced tomatoes. It's just a different element of flavor and I really, really like it. So I went ahead and just dumped the whole can, juice, tomatoes, the whole bit, all into my food processor. And then I'm gonna add half of a sweet yellow onion. I do break it down a little bit because I want my food processor to be able to chomp it up and everything. I want a nice chunky sauce, but I wanna kinda help it along in the process. And then I just kinda dug around in my fridge to see how many peppers I had left. I'd actually already made a batch of salsa for the week, but we plowed right through it. So this is my second batch for the week and I was kind of just working with what I had left. So here I'm gonna use uh, two poblano peppers and one serrano pepper because I don't know where it came from. I think I thought I was grabbing a jalapeno and I grabbed a serrano or my kids were with me. Maybe one of them just grabbed it and tossed it in there. I'm really not sure. But anyway, I ended up with a pretty chunky looking serrano. So I just went ahead and tossed him on in there for some added flavor. You don't have to go this heavy with the peppers, like one jalapeno, one serrano would be plenty if that's what you wanna do. I'm just using things up out of my fridge because I didn't want them to go bad and we really, really like the flavor of fresh peppers. Um, there's something about it, it's different than a roasted pepper and a cooked pepper, all that kind of stuff. Fresh peppers just have something different in them and I really, really like that flavor. My husband does as well, so I'm just kind of packing all of this in there. Um, you could add in some garlic or something if you want to. I typically do not do that. There's nothing wrong with it, it tastes fine. I just don't because this works and it's good and it's simple and it's fresh. Anyway, uh, that's all I'm gonna put in there and we're just gonna kind of gently chop this up in the food processor. So I have a Ninja food processor and it, um, it has a chop setting. So I'm going to do one round on the chop setting. It has a timer, it counts backwards from I think it's like 20 and just pulses a little bit. So as you can see, it just did the first round on that. It's still very, very chunky. We're gonna add in some lime juice, some salt and some pepper. And we're gonna put the lid back on and just do one more round on that chop setting. So it's like another 20 seconds of pulses. And this is still nice and chunky when we're done with that, which is exactly how we like it. Um, liquefying, it's fine too, if that's what you like. I've done that before just because I wasn't paying attention and it still tastes fabulous, but we like it with some texture. 
All right, on to the fish. So this was a great opportunity to get this last piece of salmon out of my freezer. This is some stuff that I bought pre-seasoned at Sam's Club and we did not care for it. The, um, the salmon's on the bottom and then there's tilapia, three pieces of tilapia on the top row there. So I'm just seasoning the tilapia really with salt, pepper, um, onion, garlic powder, chili powder, and smoked paprika. We're just going to season it like that and then pop it in the oven and bake it. I'm doing it at 400 degrees for about 10 minutes. I'm not looking to get this like overcooked or charred or anything like that. I just want to cook the fish all the way through. And then we're basically just going to kind of crumble it up and put it in our tacos. So while the fish is doing its thing in the oven, I went ahead and made some guacamole. Again, I've posted this on my channel, but I thought it was a good time to do a refresher because I was doing it all in one meal. This is my simple guacamole. I do have a fancier recipe that includes cream cheese and it's so delicious, but on a quick, easy meal night, I'm probably not gonna do all that stuff. I'm probably just gonna make simple, easy, quick guacamole. So I started off with my avocados, halved them, and then put the insides in a bowl. And to that, I'm gonna add some salt, pepper, garlic powder, and a little bit of lime juice and that's all that's it nothing else we're just going to mash it up until it's the consistency you want um I, I try to get most of the big chunks out of it however i know a lot of people like big chunks of avocado in theirs and that's great i think other people in my household do not which is why i mash it so much otherwise it wouldn't bother me now um I really, I didn't do this, but I really cannot recommend it enough. Feel free to throw in a scoop or two of salsa into that guacamole. It will just kick it up a notch and taste so much better. But you don't have to. I mean, you can keep it plain. That's what I'm doing. So there I am adding in the lime juice, the salt, the pepper, the garlic powder. I'm keeping it pretty simple. I personally, and my household does, we, we love the taste of avocado. Sometimes I will just slice an avocado in half and eat it for lunch. Um, it's so, so good. So we didn't need a whole lot to add to it. And then I thought the perfect side for this, originally I was gonna do some beans and I changed my mind. I kept thinking that's not the flavor profile I'm seeking. And then I saw this pineapple on my counter and like, that's it. I want that sweetness, I want that pop, I want all of it. So I went ahead and went to town, cutting the pineapple, cut the top off, uh, cut the peel off the sides. We're gonna make sure I got like all the big chunks of it off and then we're gonna cut the bottom off. And then from there, I just slice mine in half and then quarter that and I'm able to easily slice the core out of it. I actually do have one of those, um, the pineapple core slicer things and it's great, but this was a smaller pineapple and it just would not fit in there. It was too big for this. So if you've never done it by hand, this is how you cut a pineapple by hand. It's really easy and quite rewarding. Pineapples are delicious. They're really sweet. They are very citrusy. They have a bright pop of flavor and they pair well with like chicken and seafood and Mexican food. I've actually used pineapple before and mango also to make salsas that I put on fish and things like that. So it really is a great flavor profile if you were doing anything in this kind of this area here, the, um, the Mexican food for dinner. Anyway, it was the perfect side. So I'm just going to chop that and serve it. And that is it. That's dinner on this night. There's those fish tacos. They were so, so, so good. If you've not had fish tacos before, I've actually cooked them a couple of different ways, but this one might be my favorite. I think it was definitely the best. Okay, on to another night. We're going to have some what I called easy cheater chicken parmesan. So I'm starting off by making some homemade garlic bread. I just took some butter out of my fridge and uh, just a couple of tablespoons there. I think I did like four tablespoons because we're going to do a lot of bread. And it wasn't quite soft, as you can see, it was pretty hard, so I had to put it in the microwave for a couple of seconds. Once it was soft enough for me to be able to mash and, and you know, all that kind of stuff, uh, I went ahead and stirred it up just a little bit and made sure that it was still all soft all the way through. And I'm gonna add in some garlic powder and some Italian seasoning. Uh, you can add in whatever you want. I know some people like oregano and things like that. I just went pretty simple. Italian seasoning kind of covers all the bases. And I went pretty light on it. Um, I've got like four tablespoons of butter. I probably did a quarter teaspoon of garlic and a quarter teaspoon of Italian seasoning. I didn't want it to be too overwhelming, but if you like it more garlicky or something like that, go ahead and add in more. And then all I'm gonna do is take my bread and slice it in half and then just divide that butter equally for both sides. And then we're gonna bake it in the oven and that's garlic bread. It's so simple. I've made this over the years with you know, different kinds of loaves of bread or 
you know, just regular bread that you buy, sliced bread at the grocery store, just kind of whatever I have on hand. Although I do, I do think it tastes better with like Italian bread and French bread and things like that. But it's so simple. Um, I like the stuff from the freezer just as much as everybody else, but sometimes this is easier, quicker, and cheaper and what you have on hand. <laughs> anyway, I just baked that in the oven at 350 for probably about eight minutes or so, not long at all. All right, so on to the chicken parm. This is so easy. Um, I'm gonna be serving some spaghetti with mine, so I just went ahead and opened my jar of sauce, and I'm gonna just kind of smear that across the bottom of my casserole dish, just so my chicken has something to sit on. And then I've got some frozen chicken tenders. Um, I think they're the Pilgrim's brand. Yeah, Pilgrim's brand. It says crunchy chicken strips. I'm just following the package directions for baking them in the oven. I'm gonna put six on there because uh, it is myself, my husband, and my oldest that will eat this. My two younger children don't like anything with tomatoes. They won't eat this, but they'll eat the pasta. And uh, they both eat chicken nuggets and stuff like that. They just won't eat it with the tomato sauce. So anyway, we're going to put those uh, chicken tenders in there. And then, like I said, bake them according to the package directions. Once they come out of, or once they're about five minutes away from being done, go ahead and pull them out of the oven like that. And I'm going to toss them with a can of, you guessed it, fire roasted diced tomatoes. I really like my fire roasted tomatoes. I don't know what to tell you. I think that added flavor is just awesome. Um, you can always use just regular diced tomatoes. Totally up to you. I had fire roast it with garlic, so that's what we're using. I'm going to use that entire can to top all six of those chicken tenders. And then we're going to top it with some cheese. I know that chicken parmesan usually has a lot of parmesan, um, but I'm just not going that route. So I've got some sliced mozzarella cheese there, the kind you buy you know, in the sandwich section of the store. I'm just kind of tearing that up so it fits on four of those chicken pieces because if you've watched my channel, you know my oldest does not eat cheese. So it's just for my husband and myself with the cheese. I'm just gonna divide the cheese up among those pieces really well. And you can put as much or as little on there as you want. And then I have a little wedge of Parmesan and I've got my vegetable peeler. I'm just shaving off a few pieces of it to kind of top it with and add that really salty, briny flavor that Parmesan has, just so it has that great flavor. I put the Parmesan on the top and I put the chicken back in the oven for like five to 10 minutes until the cheese was all nice and melty and bubbly and delicious. And really guys, that's it. That's kind of what chicken Parmesan is. This was simple and easy. Um, I actually think that garlic bread was the hardest thing I made the whole night. So <laughs> this was so quick and so easy. I just served it with some pasta and some sauce and a little bit of garlic toast. And that was that. It was really, really good. If you like pasta, you like chicken, this was perfect. We did have chicken lumped over, no pasta, because like I said, everybody in my household eats the spaghetti, just not the sauce. So my son ate the last of the chicken the next day. He just pulled the cheese off the top. So it worked out really, really well. All right, so the last night or the last dinner for this week is breakfast. I love a good breakfast for dinner night. It just really is nice and comforting and delicious. So this night I wanted to try out this um, sausage bacon stuff I had gotten. It's it's supposed to be like sausage, just kind of shaped into bacon strips. And I have been wanting to try it for a long time. I was super excited to find it at my store because I had not seen it before. So I am following the package directions for cooking it in the oven. Um, I laid it out nicely on my lined cookie sheet. I think my oven temperature was at like 425, I think is what the package said. And I cooked it for the proper amount of time. I flipped it over in the middle so it had even cooking, which you will see here in a second. There I am flipping it over. Um, it, it looked really, really good. It had a beautiful color to it. The texture was perfect. But I got to tell you guys, I did not like the taste. I don't really think anybody in my house liked the taste. It was weird. I don't advise this. It was not my favorite. I will just stick with bacon or sausage, but I don't think we need to combine them. All right, so let's make some French toast. My kids are helping me cook tonight. So we're going to go ahead and start by cracking a couple of eggs and we're learning how to crack eggs gently. My son Camden is a little bit of a bull in a china shop when it comes to things like this that are delicate. So I'm trying to teach him to be a little more gentle with the eggs. We'll get there. It's okay, it's a work in progress. Gotta start somewhere. Anyway, we're gonna crack a couple of eggs in this bowl and to it, we're going to add in some half and half some vanilla, some maple syrup, some cinnamon, some nutmeg. Um, you can put in milk instead of half and half, but the I, I think heavy cream is too fattening, but the half and half has a little bit more fat than milk does, and I kind of just feel like it yields a better product. I don't make French toast all the time, but when I do, I kind of, I don't know, I, I kind of like it to be really, really good, and I feel like that half and half adds a little something extra. Anyway, 
We did, uh, I think it was four eggs and we're gonna add in a third of a cup of half and half. And then we're gonna do a tablespoon of vanilla, a tablespoon of maple syrup. Then I just kind of sprinkled in the cinnamon and the nutmeg. So I'm gonna say a good teaspoon of cinnamon and probably a quarter teaspoon of nutmeg. Um, enough that it, it's, you know, gonna mix really well all through it. We could taste it, it was really, really good. It had a nice warm wintery flavor to it. I really liked it. Uh, sometimes I make this and I don't feel like I put enough cinnamon in. Tonight was not that night. We put plenty in, it was perfect. Anyway, once you've got everything in the bowl, just whisk it up really, really well. And then I'm gonna cook the French toast on my griddle. I, you can cook it in a pan, but I always think it's just easier to cook it on a griddle. That's just me. And I got this new griddle for Christmas that I'm really, really loving. So it was just another excuse to get to use it. I do um, like to use butter on when I'm cooking French toast and uh, you can use cooking spray or whatever you want. I just like butter to keep it from sticking to the pan. And really the only tip or trick I have for French toast is you don't want to let the bread get too wet. So I, you know, I put it in, I flip it over, I pull it out. I'm pretty quick about it. You don't want it to in the very center to get like too super soggy because then it just has a weird consistency once you cook it. So, you know, I try to be kind of mindful of that and work fairly quickly. As you can see, I'm kind of tossing those two pieces around pretty well and getting the excess off before we put it on the pan. You can see some of the cinnamon and nutmeg really stuck to that one piece. It was super delicious. I ate that one. Anyway, we're gonna cook them just two at a time and then I will put them on that cookie sheet you see right there. My oven is still warm from cooking that sausage bacon earlier. It's probably just around 200 degrees, but I will just keep popping the French toast in there every time I'm done with another batch. So it stays nice and warm until we are ready to eat. And French toast is really just that simple. There's not much to it, but it's so, so good. Um, it's one of those things that I don't think I make it often enough. I wish I made it a little more often. My family really does enjoy it quite a bit. All right, so to go with our French toast and our sausage bacon, we're gonna make some eggs. Um, I decided I wanted to make a bigger batch of eggs so we could eat some egg and potato burritos for dinner or for breakfast the next day. So I pulled out this bag of frozen O'Brien style potatoes, which is just diced potatoes with some bell peppers and some onions. I poured about half the bag in there and I have some oil in the bottom of the skillet and I put some salt and pepper in there and that was it. We're just gonna cook this until the potatoes are heated all the way through and starting to get just a little bit of color on the outside. Once I see they're starting to kind of brown, you can see a little bit of color developing in there. Once I see that, I know, okay, it's time to go ahead and get started on the eggs. So since Camden helped me with the French toast, Jensen wanted to help with something, so he is going to be my sous chef for the eggs. He too is learning how to crack eggs. He's a little less full in the china shop, but he's still a little bit rougher than he could be. I did edit out the first egg that was just a complete disaster. He cracked it a little bit too hard and you know, it just egg everywhere. Egg number two, as you can see, went a lot better. <laughs> it made it into our little cup where I'm catching the egg so I can pull out shell in case any of it gets in there, which does happen. Anyway, I did a dozen eggs because like I said, we're gonna eat burritos with this for breakfast the following day. My kids, uh, they eat plain eggs, but they don't like potatoes or anything in their eggs. They did really enjoy the French toast though. So the eggs and the potatoes are really just for the older folks in my house, myself, my husband, and my oldest son. And this did make a really great batch. It was enough for us to have for dinner, plus three burritos for breakfast the next day. There I am fishing a little bit of that shell out of that cup. Like I said, it happens, it does. <laughs> it's unfortunate, but it's easy enough to get out. Anyway, he's learning, you know, I give him a break on it. He's got to learn somehow and that's okay. Anyway, to my eggs, since I already had the half and half out for the French toast, I'm going to use that in my eggs instead of a dollop of milk. I don't pour too much in there. I've got, like I said, a dozen eggs. I probably poured in about a tablespoon or so of half and half. Just a dollop will do you. Isn't that what they say for sour cream? Hmm. Okay, well, a dollop will do you on half and half too. Anyway, I'm just going to add that in and just kind of whisk it together until the eggs are completely, you know, scrambled in the bowl. And that is that. I will add them to the pan with the potatoes. And then I just cook them on kind of like a low to medium heat. I don't want to go, you know, overkill with it because I like the eggs to stay nice and soft and delicate. I do try to be really careful about that when I'm cooking them. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen like the Gordon Ramsay method where you just stir constantly and they're super creamy and delicious. I really love them that way. However, they don't make for a great reheated burrito the next day. So that is not what I did. 
Um, I just kind of cooked them normally, but I did, like I said, kind of low to medium heat. I was gentle with them so that they're still nice and soft. They don't develop any of that weird brownness because they overcooked on the bottom or anything like that. Ooh, look how fast I scramble those eggs. I wish I was that fast in real life. That'd be great, wouldn't it? Anyway, there I am with the potatoes. We're going to pour in the eggs and just let them cook. And that really was dinner. You know, we had the egg potato as a side. We had the bacon sausage that I didn't like. And we had the French toast. Um, at this point, I'd already tried the bacon sausage and knew I didn't like it. So when you see the picture of dinner, that was my plate. There is no bacon sausage because I didn't want any. Uh, anyway, it was really good. It's nice to have breakfast for dinner sometime. I kind of felt pretty good about the whole week. We didn't do anything like terribly fancy, but all the meals were really good. They were really filling. They were very easy and quick. And most of it was like stuff I had in my deep freeze as far as the meat and everything went. So I was pretty pleased with this week. What do you guys think? I hope you guys liked it. If you have any ideas or recipe suggestions or anything like that, my email is listed below in the description box. So hit me up. Share some ideas with me. I love trying new recipes. Anyway, that's going to do it for this week. If you like this kind of stuff or grocery hauls or just kind of like around the house stuff because I am a stay-at-home mom, then go ahead and click that subscribe button and the notification bell so you can keep up with all my content. Anyway, guys, that is all for this week. Thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate you guys so, so much, and I will see you soon with another video. Bye.